Good morning. So good to see your bright, beautiful half faces. I got to good to see you. I'm so excited. How are you doing? Good. You forgot your mask? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and get it. Okay. Yep. Uh, man, I haven't seen y'all in a long time. Well, I saw you last night, but mm -hmm. still, before then. Uh, anyway, I know I've got some new faces, so I'm going to do uh, attendance real quick, and then uh, we will uh, pick up where we left off from your class on the video lecture. <laughs> uh, I know it's going to be awkward. And then, um, even before we start class, I'll have some announcements for you. Um, I had my Dalton State mask on, but it was too big. I think I can adjust it all the time. So now I'm wearing my Darth Vader mask, so I like it. Hopefully it, you know, scares some folks. Can you all in the back hear me okay? Okay, and quick question, on the video lecture, how many of you, have you watched it? Kept up? Okay, I tried my best. That was up within an hour of getting out of class. I tried to do my best to go upstairs on my laptop. Could you hear me okay? Even in the video? Okay, good. I was really worried about being muffled. So, all right. So, I saw, okay. April is here. Um, Alan. Here. Okay. All right. And is everybody comfortable in the seat that they've chosen? Okay. Because in the syllabus you read about the contract, contact tracing so I can see where you, I see and know where you sit. Okay, uh, in case someone gets, uh, has to be quarantined or has been exposed. Uh, see, Lupita's here. Ruben's here. Ariel? There you are. Uh, ben? And I saw Samantha. Refugio, is that you back there? Yeah. Okay. Carla? There you are. It's your last semester. Uh, oh, oh my goodness. Is anybody else in here graduating? All right! Yay! Congratulations! We have four. So Carla, Ariel, Samantha, and Refugio. Wow! I didn't know I had that many graduates. Oh, let's see. Jenna, there you are. Um, in just a minute, I will let you make the announcements about the t-shirts and okay. that sort of thing. Um, Kason, I saw you back there. Um, Amara, is that you? Okay. Welcome, nice to meet you. I know Jenna, it's like our first time seeing each other face to face since you had me online this summer. I don't see Autumn back there. I uh, saw so Robley was back there. And then Jesus. So Jesus. All right, nice to meet you, Jesus. And same for you, Alan. Welcome to my class. All right, so that, that rolled up today. What, the 13th? Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Like I said, I have a few announcements. Uh, there's going to be some overlap between, in some cases, between victimology and my sex trafficking class that I have on Wednesday night. So I know April, you're in there Wednesday night. Is anybody else in there that uh, I'm missing? Okay, I think there's one other. He's in the Tuesday section. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Jenna, uh, you have the, I can pull up the t shirt for yeah, that's while you. Yeah. Oh. Actually, it's, ooh, it's on my email. I don't want to pull up my email. Well, I want you to see it. I should have copied and pasted it. Let me just turn this over. Um, while you're talking about it, I'll pull the t-shirt. Okay, go ahead. Um, my name is Jenna. For those of you that don't know me, I'm pretty sure you know me. Um, I took uh, labor and organ trafficking over the summer with Dr. Johnson, and it really made a difference in my life. And I've been studying up on the human trafficking that's going on within the world. And I learned that there is an end it movement, and they do it on February 13th. I think they're doing it next year on February 13th. And it's to help raise awareness and make donations towards human trafficking. I have a friend that's making t-shirts that are $10 a piece. She can sell them to me in a bunch, and then anybody who wants to buy one, you're more than welcome to. Just send me your email and your shirt size and what color you want, and I can get it to her. Um, I want to raise more awareness and try and do a fundraiser or a movement event in February if I can get it approved. Um, and if y'all are more than welcome to join us if you want to, um, y'all just shoot me an email with your information and we'll get it started. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, I found it. Yay. Um, and 
and she can get it, you can get the t-shirt that I'm about to show you, you can get it in what, any color? Yeah, any any color, color you want. So I actually just uh, put in my order yesterday and I asked for a blue one for reasons you will see in just a moment, okay? Uh, and if, let's see, I know you had labor in our trafficking, Kason was in there, was anybody else in labor in our, that Carla and Lupita, so we have four people in here who are there. So y'all remember hashtag our blue day? Y'all see it coming in this month, don't you? Mm -hmm. I wish you could see my smile. And my lipstick. I do still wear my lipstick in here. I know that's dumb. I feel naked without my lipstick. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, but I've got the t-shirt rolled up front here. Um, and what does the money go to or again? Um, there's a website and it's called Thorn Thorn. Yeah. And it raises awareness for child sex trafficking. And all the money that she raises for these t-shirts, from these t-shirts, there's like, I think it's like 75% is going to Thorn. Okay. All right. I'm walking just another one. All right, so that's what it looks like. It's going to try to make it a little bit bigger. Um, ignore the ever after monogram. That won't be on your shirt. It will be this part right here. And... Um, so I chose blue, you can pick whatever color you want. Obviously no obligation, I know these might be tough times for you monetarily, but if you or anybody you know is interested, you can let me know, you can let Jenna know, and we will get you taken care of, okay? Um, and you can see me after class, shoot me an email, uh, whatever, okay? So, kind of the next part is uh, what we call the there's, it's called the Blue Campaign, which is through uh, Homeland Security. And they do something, they do all kinds of things to raise awareness. So in this class, we don't really get that much in depth in terms of talking about labor and sex trafficking, but we still cover a little bit because most of you in here have not had those classes. So it's to kind of give you a brief little introduction uh, when we get to that topic. Mostly it's when we talk about child exploitation, the child exploitation chapter later in the semester. So anyway, there's all kinds of ways to raise awareness, and one of those is through doing, um, they call it hashtag wear blue day, so you wear blue, and then you take a picture and then you post on social media. And it's not just your picture, but you have like a caption, you know, educating others about some of the basics like red flags or dispelling myths surrounding any form of human trafficking uh, that you wish. And we did this over the summer in my labor and organ trafficking class. I'm gonna show you a little slideshow, some of the clips that uh, we did because we're going to do the same thing. Now, let me tell you a little bit about So, January is actually Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Well, we're not going to be in here in January, nor were we in the summer from our June to July class. So, every January 11th is hashtag Wear Blue Day. Well, so this summer we made up our own Wear Blue Day, and then we chose July 11th. This semester, we're going to choose October 11th to do ours. Uh, for obvious reasons, we're going to not do September 11th, and we don't want to wait till November. And October is actually perfect because October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and when you learn anything about sex trafficking especially, that domestic violence is involved in a lot of your cases, okay? So I figure October 11th would be perfect. Let me show you kind of like what kind of what we're talking about. And then you'll mark your calendars for what for what we're gonna do. Uh, let's see here. So uh, Corey, he was in the class this summer. He's he was in my class last night, so I have his permission to use this. But let me turn the front light off. You can see this a little bit better. Um, he did his own post, but he actually. Part of their job over the summer was to educate other people about what they're learning in every single journal they did, which was every single class. It's intense. So he actually got a lot of his friends to do it too, do their own posts, and he compiled all of their pictures. So and it wasn't just him. You can be unique about it. Clothes, makeup, hair, ma mask. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to try and see, I think last night we talked about trying to get um, some unique blue masks to do for a picture, a group photo. Uh, let's see, I wonder if my printer works. I don't know why. It's so, just to try to give you an idea of like the differences that people did. Um, knowledge up here, post, you could do a poster board if you wish, whatever. Um, let's see here, some other ones. So, we got Jenna, we got you, um, Wash got you, got you right there. Um, so, you have all kinds of unique ways to create your own, your own post. Uh, we got a couple more there. Oh, Carla, there you are. We got you. And by the way, so here's your assignment. If you want to write down, write this down in your notebook. So October 11th is actually on a Sunday. Now, uh, we clearly are not in class on Sunday. You don't have to take the picture actually that day. You just need to do the post that day. So I figure on that Thursday for our group, which. What day would that be? October 8th. October 8th. Thursday, October 8th. Wear your blue. It can be something as simple as a mask. So, like I see your video, you've got your Dalton State mask on. You even have a blue shirt on today. I even have on navy today. Um, it doesn't. Have, you don't have to go out and be fancy. It can be very simple, so don't break the bank, don't buy anything new if you don't have to. Um, so Thursday, October 8th, come to class wearing something blue. We'll get somebody to take our picture. So you can have a group photo, but then you're going to do your own individual photo on whatever day you want to take your own picture. Okay, or have someone take a picture or do a selfie. Uh, so your assignment is, in addition to coming class on the, it'll be a participate, like easy points. Coming to class that day wearing blue, and then uh, you'll do your own post, your own wear, hashtag wear blue day post. You'll screenshot it, and you'll email it to me. That's what you'll get credit for. Very easy peasy, right? The second part, which is not for credit, this is completely up to you, it's optional. In the email, you will let me know if I have permission or not to share it on my social media. You are not obligated to. Um, some, uh, there were a few people that said no over the summer. That's perfectly fine. That does not count against you. Uh, but most people did say yes. That's your choice. Um, completely your choice. And then, so, and then that Sunday, um, you'll screenshot it and you'll email it to me and I'll have it all ready. That I can post that day as well. All right, so uh, that makes sense. Everybody, anybody, any questions? You all know me. I have to. I always have to do extra. I can't help it. <laughs> so I have my blue wig. I'll probably. I don't know. I haven't decided if I want to do blue or purple here this fall. It'll be a different color soon. What do y'all think? Blue or purple? Ooh. <laughs> I like that. Hope that doesn't cost too much. <laughs> I haven't gotten my hair done in so long. I've had to do it myself, cut and color my own hair twice. See, I have a secret talent cutting my own hair twice. I've actually cut my hair several times, but um, anyway, both. I like that idea because October <laughs> is, as I said, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and that color is purple. So, Here's your other thing that we do just for fun. It's, uh, I mean, you can do it too. Like a, it's a, it's this year National Wear Purple Day is on October 24th. Last year was the 19th. But I don't know why it's, it's why it can't just be the same day every year. But this year it's the 24th. I'm gonna pull out my phone just because I can't remember what day of the week that was. Even though we just Saturday. is it Saturday? Thank you. Um, so, October 24th is Saturday, so on October 22nd, put that down in your notes <laughs> or your calendar, you'll come to class wearing something purple. Now, this is more of a local kind of competition. So, um, last year, 
in my human my human trafficking class. We did this. Do you remember? Yeah. And whoever I think Carla was in there. Anybody else in human trafficking last fall? Okay. But y'all remember we all wore some purple. We got creative. I had my big old purple tutu on. I think I still had purple hair at that point. Um, and our class actually won the contest. And so at the end of the semester, we got, was it Krispy Kreme donuts? Dunkin' Donuts. Huh? It was, it was Dunkin' Donuts. It was Dunkin' Donuts. Hell, good donuts. <laughs> good, good donuts and coffee. Uh, so that was pretty cool. The Crisis Center is someone who's, who, who does that. So it's a national thing, but the Crisis Center does their own contest. And whoever wins. Um, so you can do your own individual one if you want. So at least I'm only asking for a group photo for that one. Uh, so, any questions? All right, the next, and I think, I think final announcement is still on Domestic Violence Awareness Month on uh, Wednesday, October 7th. Wednesday, October 7th is our Walk a Mile in Hershey's event. How many of you have heard of the event before? The Welcome Out of Hershey's event. Okay. So for those of you that may not have heard of it, including those who are my Tuesday session, the Welcome Out of Her uh, Welcome Out of Hershey's event is a it's an actually an international event. Okay. Um, you it's meant to raise awareness around sexualized violence, domestic violence. Oh, sorry, I needed to put your Thank you. Um, it's an international event, sexualized violence to raise awareness about that, domestic violence, stuff like that. Uh, so anybody can actually do this event so long as they register through the organization online and they have the they pay they pay the fees for the trademark. And every year the Northwest Georgia, Northwest Georgia Family Crisis Center will ha has the they, they purchased the rights to do the Walk Around in Her Shoes event. And our Criminal Justice Club on campus, LAE, we sponsor it or we host it, and it's a fundraiser. And the best way, what we'll kind of a cooler way to gain attention than is to get guys to wear high heels, right? And I, I don't have any, I had some pulled up last night, but uh, you can imagine guys wearing high heels. Ruben, would you wear some high heels for us? No, yeah, you I don't guess. want to. It doesn't matter. Huh? I guess. You guess, okay. What about the rest of you guys? Would you do it? We, we have a contest. You can win a gift card to go eat. So it's really fun. We have a great time with it. Um, so it starts, the walk starts at noon. And we don't act, as far as I know, I've led the walk every single time since 2015. I don't know that it's actually a full mile, but it's quite a way, especially, could you imagine walking in shoes like this? <laughs> so, um, anyway, I will have the form, as soon as the forms are read or, oh, read, bleh, if I can speak, as soon as the forms are ready for pre-registration, so you sign up, um, you pay, it costs $10, and you get a t-shirt, and you can part participate or not. It's up to you. I, I really wish that you would. There you go. I know, it's easy for them to slip down. Um, what was I saying? $10, and when you pre-register, you are guaranteed not only your t-shirt, but your t-shirt size. Um, but I'm saying that because we also have, we will have on-site registration for those that either maybe forget or maybe you've got friends that walk up or maybe just random adult state students that want to walk up and participate. Um, that will start at 11.30. The shoe contest, so you guys, if you want to participate and you want to try to win and have like the most creative uh, shoe, then you have the chance to win a, some sort of gift card to go out to eat. That's always a lot of fun. Then around noon, we have a very brief speaker. Uh, there, last year, we had one of our former graduates who is now a law enforcement officer for Dalton PD, uh, Cole McDaniel. I don't know if any of you know him. But he, was, he did such a good job 
Because um, he, he sat in your shoes, in your seat, a few years ago taking victimology as well. Um, he did a great job speaking for us last year. Again, it's like a few minutes, and then off we go, and we have a really great time, and you're usually done about 1 o'clock, if not a little bit earlier. And it's a great cause. And so last year, we actually were able to get double the, uh, I guess you would say, profits. Uh, we raised double than we ever, uh, the most we ever had, and double what we've ever done. And you know how I did that? Y'all remember? remember? How did I do it, Carla? You gave us points to see how many people we signed up. There you go. So is everybody listening? Because y'all know Dr. Dr. doesn't do extra credit. So your ears perk up. <coughs> y'all didn't seem very excited last night. I don't know what, if y'all are just tired or what. <laughs> so here is your opportunity. And you can, uh, for up to 25 bonus points, for each person you get to participate, you can get up, up to 25 points. So one person equals one point. So if you get 25 people, that's up to 25 points. Okay. And here's the thing, you're in two of my classes, right? That would count for both of your classes. Cool, right? Right? So you double dip. Yeah, double dipping. Uh, so think about where you work. Um, I had one student last fall, she waited tables, and she, she hustled. She asked like all of her tables, and she had a lot of people that, and here's the thing is that they don't actually have to walk because they may not be physically able to walk, but maybe they want to contribute. Maybe they would like a t-shirt. Um, I would prefer as many people participate as possible. Right now we don't have a cap on the number that can participate, and we're assuming also that we're still open. However, if we're, for whatever reason, if Dalton State does close, the crisis center will probably just simply just move the walk elsewhere. Okay, so it's probably going to happen no matter what, but the location is at the quad. I forgot to tell you all that last night, but it's at the quad. That's where we always start. So you probably want to get there around like 11.30, 11.45. Um, but back to your bonus points. Um, one person, um, one point up to 25. Now you can recruit as many as you wish if you get up to 25 points. And it doesn't include yourself, okay? does not include, because I want you to do it because it's the right thing to do, and only if you can afford it. Again, I understand that these are tough times for people. Ten dollars is a big deal for a lot of people right now, okay? So I get it. Um, but do the best you can. Sound like a cool idea? Cool opportunity? Some of you may not need the bonus points, but hey, it's nice to have a little cushion or buffer, all right? Any questions? Okay. Ended off, we watched the, the first video of Amy Cunningham. Did anybody in here already watch the second video by chance? The one on Guy Lynch, this one right here. How many of you already watched it? Just, just It's okay. I didn't ask you to, to watch it. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to start it now. So if you watched it, great. If, if you already watched it, well, I guess maybe you can take a nap or something for 17 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to show this one. It's about 17 minutes, I think. And uh, then we'll, we'll do a little activity afterwards. I grew up with my identical twin, 
who was an incredibly loving brother. Now, one thing about being a twin is it makes you an expert at spotting favoritism. If his cookie was even slightly bigger than my cookie, I had questions. And uh, clearly, I wasn't starving. When I became a psychologist, I began to notice favoritism of a different kind. And that is how much more we value the body than we do the mind. I spent nine years at university earning my doctorate in psychology, and I can't tell you how many people look at my business card and say, oh, a psychologist, so not a real doctor. As if it should say that on my card. <laughs> this favoritism, we show the body over the mind. I see it everywhere. I recently was at a friend's house and their five-year-old was getting ready for bed. He was standing on a stool by the sink, brushing his teeth, when he slipped and scratched his leg on the stool when he fell. He cried for a minute, but then he got back up, got back on the stool, and reached out for a box of Band-Aids to put one on his cut. Now, this kid could barely tie his shoelaces, but he knew you have to cover a cut so it doesn't become infected, and you have to care for your teeth by brushing twice a day. We all know how to maintain our physical health and how to practice dental hygiene, right? We, we know it since we were five years old. But what do we know about maintaining our psychological health? Well, nothing. What do we teach our children about emotional hygiene? Nothing. How is it we spend more time taking care of our teeth than we do our minds. Why is it our physical health is so much more important to us than our psychological health? You know, we sustain psychological injuries even more often than we do physical ones. Injuries like failure or rejection or loneliness. And they can also get worse if we ignore them. And they can impact our lives in dramatic ways. And yet, even though there are scientifically proven techniques we could use to treat these kinds of psychological injuries, we don't. It doesn't even occur to us that we should. Oh, you're feeling depressed. Just shake it off. It's all in your head. Can you imagine saying that to somebody with a broken leg? Oh, just walk it off. It's all in your leg. <laughs> it is time we close the gap between our physical and our psychological health. It's time we made them more equal, more like twins. Speaking of which, my brother is also a psychologist, so he's not a real doctor either. <laughs> we didn't study together, though. In fact, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is move across the Atlantic to New York City to get my doctorate in psychology. We were apart then for the first time in our lives, and the separation was brutal for both of us. But while he remained among family and friends, I was alone in a new country. We missed each other terribly, but international phone calls were really expensive then, and we could only afford to speak for five minutes a week. When our birthday rolled around, it was the first we wouldn't be spending together. We decided to splurge, and that week we would talk for ten minutes. I spent the morning pacing around my room, waiting for him to call. And waiting. And waiting. But the phone didn't ring. Given the time difference, I assumed, okay, he's out with friends, he'll call later. There were no cell phones then. But he didn't. And I began to realize that after being away for over 10 months, he no longer missed me the way I missed him. Now, I knew he would call in the morning, but that night was one of the saddest and longest nights of my life. I woke up the next morning, I glanced down at the phone, and I realized I had kicked it off the hook when pacing the day before. I stumbled out of bed, I put the phone back on the receiver, and it rang a second later. And it was my brother. And boy, was he pissed. <laughs> the 
It was the saddest and longest night of his life as well. Now, I tried to explain what happened, but he said, I don't understand. If you saw I wasn't calling you, why didn't you just pick up the phone and call me? He was right. Why didn't I call him? I didn't have an answer then. But I do today, and it's a simple one. Loneliness. Loneliness creates a deep psychological wound, one that distorts our perceptions and scrambles our thinking. It makes us believe that those around us care much less than they actually do. It makes us really afraid to reach out because why set yourself up for rejection and heartache when your heart is already aching more than you could stand? I was in the grips of real loneliness back then, but I was surrounded by people all day, so it never occurred to me. But loneliness is defined purely subjectively. It depends solely on whether you feel emotionally or socially disconnected from those around you, and I did. There is a lot of research on loneliness, and all of it is horrifying. Loneliness won't just make you miserable, it will kill you. I'm not kidding. Chronic loneliness increases your likelihood of an early death by 14%. 14%. Loneliness causes high blood pressure, high cholesterol. It even suppresses the functioning of your immune system, making you vulnerable to all kinds of illnesses and diseases. In fact, scientists have concluded that taken together, chronic loneliness poses as significant a risk for your long-term health and longevity as cigarette smoking. Now, cigarette packs come with warnings saying this could kill you. But loneliness doesn't. And that's why it's so important we prioritize our psychological health, that we practice emotional hygiene. Because you can't treat a psychological wound if you don't even know you're injured. Loneliness isn't the only psychological wound that distorts our perceptions and misleads us. Failure does that as well. I once visited a daycare center where I saw three toddlers play with identical plastic toys. You had to slide the red button and a cute doggy would pop out. One little girl tried pulling the purple button, then pushing it, and then she just sat back and looked at the box with her lower lip trembling. The little boy next to her watched this happen, then turned to his box and burst into tears without even touching it. Meanwhile, another little girl tried everything she could think of until she slid the red button Cute doggy popped out, and she squealed with delight. So, three toddlers with identical plastic toys, but with very different reactions to failure. The first two toddlers were perfectly capable of sliding a red button. The only thing that prevented them from succeeding was their mind, tripped them into believing they could not. Now, adults get tripped this way as well, all the time. In fact, we all have a default set of feelings and beliefs that gets triggered whenever we encounter frustrations and setbacks. Are you aware of how your mind reacts to failure? You need to be. Because if your mind tries to convince you you're incapable of something and you believe it, then like those two toddlers, you'll begin to feel helpless and you'll stop trying too soon or you won't even try at all. And then you'll be even more convinced you can't succeed. You see, that's why so many people function below their actual potential. Because somewhere along the way, sometimes a single failure convinced them that they couldn't succeed and they believed it. Once we become convinced of something, it's very difficult to change our mind. I learned that lesson the hard way when I was a teenager with my brother. We were driving with friends down a dark road at night when a police car stopped us. There had been a robbery in the area and they were looking for suspects. The officer approached the car and he shined his flashlight on the driver, then on my brother in the front seat, and then on me, and his eyes opened wide, and he said, where have I seen your face before? <laughs> and I said, in the front seat. <laughs> but that made no sense to him whatsoever, so now he thought I was on drugs. 
So he drags me out of the car, he searches me, he marches me over to the police car, and only when he verified I don't have a police record could I show him I had a twin in the front seat. But even as we were driving away, you could see by the look on his face, he was convinced that I was getting away with something. Our mind is hard to change once we become convinced. So it might be very natural to feel demoralized and defeated after you fail, but you cannot allow yourself to become convinced you can't succeed. You have to fight feelings of helplessness. You have to gain control over the situation. And you have to break this kind of negative cycle before it begins. Our minds and our feelings, they're not the trustworthy friends we thought they were. They're more like a really moody friend who can be totally supportive one minute and really unpleasant the next. I once worked with this woman who, after 20 years of marriage and an extremely ugly divorce, was finally ready for her first date. She had met this guy online, and he seemed nice, and he seemed successful, and most importantly, he seemed really into her. So she was very excited. She bought a new dress, and they met at an upscale New York City bar for a drink. Ten minutes into the date, the man stands up and says, I'm not interested, and walks out. Rejection is extremely painful. The woman was so hurt, she couldn't move. All she could do was call a friend. And here's what the friend said. Well, what do you expect? You have big hips. You have nothing interesting to say. Why would a handsome, successful man like that ever go out with a loser like you? Shocking, right, that a friend can be so cruel. But it would be much less shocking if I told you it wasn't the friend who said that. It's what the woman said to herself. And that's something we all do, especially after a rejection. We all start thinking of all our faults and all our shortcomings, what we wish we were, what we wish we weren't. We call ourselves names, maybe not as harshly, but we all do it. And it's interesting that we do, because our self-esteem is already hurting. Why would we want to go and damage it even further? Right? We, we wouldn't make a physical injury worse on purpose. You wouldn't get a cut on your arm and decide, oh, I know, I'm going to take a knife and see how much deeper I can make it. But we do that with psychological injuries all the time. Why? Because of poor emotional hygiene. Because we don't prioritize our psychological health. We know from dozens of studies that when your self-esteem is lower, you are more vulnerable to stress and to anxiety, that failures and rejections hurt more and it takes longer to recover from them. So when you get rejected, the first thing you should be doing is to revive your self-esteem, not join Fight Club and beat it into a pulp. When you're in emotional pain, treat yourself with the same compassion you would expect from a truly good friend. We have to catch our unhealthy psychological habits and change them. And one of the unhealthiest and most common is called rumination. To ruminate means to chew over. It's when your boss yells at you, or your professor makes you feel stupid in class, or you have a big fight with a friend, and you just can't stop replaying the scene in your head for days, or sometimes for weeks on end. Now, ruminating about upsetting events in this way can easily become a habit, and it's a very costly one. Because by spending so much time focused on upsetting and negative thoughts, you are actually putting yourself at significant risk for developing clinical depression, alcoholism, eating disorders, and even cardiovascular disease. The problem is, the urge to ruminate can feel really strong and really important, so it's a difficult habit to stop. And I know this for a fact, because a little over a year ago, I developed the habit myself. You see, my twin brother was diagnosed with stage 3 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. His cancer was extremely aggressive. He had visible tumors all over his body. And he had to start a harsh course of chemotherapy. And I couldn't stop thinking about what he was going through. I couldn't stop thinking about how much he was suffering. Even though he never complained. Not once. He had this incredibly positive attitude. His psychological health was amazing. I was physically healthy, 
but psychologically I was a mess. But I knew what to do. Studies tell us that even a two-minute distraction is sufficient to break the urge to ruminate in that moment. And so each time I had a worrying, upsetting, negative thought, I forced myself to concentrate on something else until the urge passed. And within one week, my whole outlook changed and became more positive and more hopeful. Nine weeks after he started chemotherapy, my brother had a CAT scan, and I was by his side when he got the results. All the tumors were gone. He still had three more rounds of chemotherapy to go, but we knew he would recover. This picture was taken two weeks ago. By taking action when you're lonely, by changing your responses to failure, by protecting your self-esteem, by battling negative thinking, you won't just heal your psychological wounds. You will build emotional resilience. You will thrive. You know, a hundred years ago, people began practicing personal hygiene, and life expectancy rates rose by over 50% in just a matter of decades. I believe our quality of life could rise just as dramatically if we all began practicing emotional hygiene. Could you imagine what the world would be like if everyone were psychologically healthier, if there were less loneliness and less depression, if people knew how to overcome failure, if they felt better about themselves and more empowered, if they were happier and more fulfilled? I can, because that's the world I want to live in. And that's the world my brother wants to live in as well. And if you just become informed and change a few simple habits, well, that's the world we can all live in. Thank you very much.
Yeah, you can go and get started on it. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. you can, well, I mean, you can start writing now and you can finish it. Okay. Sound good? Yeah.
check. He was already done. Just, just one. Okay. Keep, keep working. If you're, if you're done, feel free to do whatever you wish. Just half the time.
going to have in about the next three minutes. Who's already done? This is all I can get. If you want to add some more, um, you have, I'm giving my Tuesday section until to turn it in all the way up until right before class Tuesday. So those of you that are already done, great, you're done. Um, if you want to add more, you're certainly welcome to, but by no means do you have to. Um, but I, what I do want to do, Spin, for the last 10 minutes is talking about this, uh, this question that I have up here on the board. Uh, because you heard Dr. Guy Winch. Bring up the concept of loneliness, right? So let me ask you this. Do you think that the pandemic and being uh, isolated and quarantined, has that been traumatic for people? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, I, I don't know what your answer is, but for me, personally, um, I had a hard time the first split two weeks. Um, not necessarily with the loneliness or isolation or anything like that, but just thinking about everybody else. Like I kept thinking about all the people who lost their jobs. Um, even something as simple as looking at how cheap gas was would be like a trigger for me. Like you would normally be like, woohoo, a dollar thirty-five for gas. Like so, one day I saw it and like I just started bawling. Like what? Where did that come from? Like normally you would be happy, but it's a different circumstance. It's a sign that your economy is is tanked. It's a sign that people are living in hard times. You see people. Uh, out on the side of the road asking for money. Um, so for me, I know we had to do, there was a research study that they were doing for um, faculty, and at the very end of the survey, they asked us to give one word to use to describe the pandemic, and I put traumatic, because for me, it was. Now, I've long moved past that, okay? Was it traumatic for any of you, 
It's okay if it wasn't. Everybody's different. Say no. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I still work too. I just, uh, my hard time just is thinking about everybody else. I just felt lucky to still have a job. Uh, a lot of people at Dallas State lost their jobs. I don't know if you knew that, but um, they did. So, anyway. What are some of the byproducts of the pandemic? Like, uh, I gave you one, which is loneliness. Okay. All right. And then what he told you? Yep. Question. And that loneliness actually increases, uh, lowers your life expectancy by 14%. What research tells us. Most of us wouldn't think about that, would we? If anything, if this pandemic has taught us anything, if we didn't already know it, is that humans are social animals. We need to be around other people. We need that interaction. We need to be able to talk to people and not just through a computer screen, right? This is why it's been so tough on people. Um, you know, the, the, the data is not out yet. Um, it's not conclusive. But I would be willing to bet my life on it to hypothesize that suicide rates will have skyrocketed during the pandemic. It's a, it's a hypothesis. I don't know. What do you all think? I see some, at least one person sitting there. You know, something to think about. So again, the data's not out yet. We don't know. It'll, it'll take a while for us to have the numbers, but something to think about. So I heard somebody say depression. Was that you, Ben? Mm -hmm. No, Jenna. Yeah, depression's going up. And for people who, not, who don't even have the diagnosis of depression, depression is going up because you are lonely, okay? Um, what other, on my Tuesday class, you picked up on it in the video lecture, there's another byproduct, a negative byproduct of the pandemic. Did you catch it? One of the topics we cover in this course, intimate partner violence. The preliminary data suggests that those domestic violence rates have gone up, at least the reported rate. So DV stands for domestic violence. Because, like I said in my Tuesday class, when you are stuck at home, meaning you have nowhere to, no, no work to go to, maybe you lost your job, um, you've got no school to go to now anymore, it's all online, and even churches or whatever faith community you go to is closed. You have no reprieve. Like, your only reprieve would be to, gr to go to the grocery store, if you're even allowed to. In domestic violence relationships, it's all about power and control. So you may not even, if you're the victim, you may not be allowed to leave the house to go to the store. And we'll talk later about, we don't ask the question, why doesn't she just leave? That's a, that's a victim blaming question. Instead, we would ask, what barriers keep victims from leaving? What barriers keep women from leaving domestic violence relationships? What barriers keep men from leaving domestic violence relationships. So yes, men can be and are victims of domestic violence. Um, generally, it's more often be women, um, but men certainly can be too, and the numbers for men is probably a lot higher than what we know, because why? They don't want to report. Exactly, they don't want to report. Why don't they want to report? <laughs> Makes them feel weak, kind of like what we talked about Tuesday's class, the way boys and girls are socialized differently. Boys are taught to, uh, to be tough and to take care of themselves, to not ask for help, and asking for help equals weakness. And heaven forbid a man be uh, controlled or physically or psychologically abused by a woman. People that are uneducated in that topic will tend to laugh at it and make fun of. And that's not funny. Abuse is not funny, period. Um, it doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman. But the thing about words, they have nowhere to go. Where to go. Uh, what else? Anything else? There's, there's, there's lots more. I mean, think about 
maybe your own personal experiences or some rough things your friends went through. Family members who were who got positive. I had a few members who got positive. Okay. Um, obviously, the illness itself is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so you 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 knew some people. Yeah, I had to be in quarantine too. Uh, it was back in June. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was living okay. like one a week ago with my cousin. Uh huh. Then, like, a week later, he called and said, I got tested positive. Like, okay. In quarantine. Yeah, and so when you're exposed, thus you have to quarantine, thus you are isolated and lonely. I think right? it's all on those who are still working too, so I'm not further. There was, for three weeks, we had 15 people out. And eight were in my department alone. Wow. So I'm a part-time employee, but I was pulling 50, 60 hours a week. Oh my goodness. Just so we could have the help that we needed. Right. We were having to pull people, yeah. We were having to pull people from other uh, other shores just to help us. Right. So we could all have a day off that we needed. Absolutely. So have to pull the weight for other people whenever they're out sick. Uh, for sure. And that puts a lot of added stress. And we've talked in Tuesday classes to say right now. What does stress do to the body? You learned it Tuesday. Repeat it again. Lowers your immune system. He talked a little bit about that. So you're susceptible to illnesses, um, all kinds of things. I've known a few people who have also had COVID, nothing personal, but I did have, I did get exposed. Uh, was it in June? It, I it was actually the day that my best friend's son died. I found out that my boyfriend had been exposed to a positive person at work. Um, I didn't get tested, but you know, I was teaching online, so I did, you know, it's fine. But it turned out negative, but it, yeah, it's scary. Because uh, you don't know how it's going to affect you. You don't know if you're going to be that random young person where it's really going to hit you hard. You don't know. Um, but the big takeaway here is this part right here. We don't really think a lot about how loneliness can affect our physical and emotional health. And I know I had you focus on this in your paper, but I'll end on this note. You know, because this is, this is directly related to crime and victimology. Because most criminals, or most people who were abused as kids, do not grow up to become offenders. You've probably learned that in most of your classes. But of all offenders are, that are out there, what has happened to them in their childhood? Some kind of abuse. So could you imagine, and abuse oftentimes causes psychological issues. So if we didn't have that, could you imagine how much less crime and victimization we would have? It's a huge thing to think about. All right, so with that, you are dismissed. I will see you all in your Thursday class next week. Um, great to finally see you all again. Fantastic. And Rosie Hill, you can keep that button. Thank you.